Good evening, one and all. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I am the acting chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington. Uh, just a couple of messages for, uh, for everyone. Um, the, we are being recorded this evening, so all the comments will be available on ACMI. Um, there is a sign-in sheet at the back, which we ask you to please sign in, especially if you're planning on uh, speaking. It just helps when we do the minutes at the end to get your name correctly. Um, so I am the acting chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Our elected chair had to resign unexpectedly, um, and so I am covering in his stead. Um, I'm going to ask the board, with their permission, that at our next hearing we hold a vote for uh, a new chair and new vice chair, just so we have fully elected members going forward. Um, I would also like to welcome uh, Kevin Mills and Patrick Hanlon, who were recently appointed from associate status to full members of our board. I'm very glad to have you on board. And if anyone is interested in being an associate member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, <laughs> there is an application process available. Please contact the Select Board. Um, I'm <clears throat> going to uh, take the first two items um, and reverse them. I have apologies to those who are here from Melvin Road. Um, so we'll start with docket number 3612, 1314 Massachusetts Avenue. If the proponents could come forward, please. So if you could introduce yourselves and tell us what you're doing. Sure, Michael Bettencourt on behalf of First House Club LLC, the applicant. Uh, James O'Rourke, um, owner of the First House. Uh, grew up on Renfrew Street, class of 87 for a long time. And so you gentlemen here for a variance from the parking requirements, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if you wanted me to just Absolutely. present an overview. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, First House LLC is requesting zoning relief from Article 8, Section 8.01 of the zoning bylaw requiring one parking space for each four seats of seating capacity. The subject property located at 1314 Massachusetts Avenue in Arlington Heights, formerly the site of the Bailage Five and Dime, does not have any uh, parking connected directly or indirectly to the property and the applicant wishes to establish a restaurant in this, this location with approximately seven seats, which is allowed in the B3 Village Business District. Um, and because of this highly restricted parking requirement, the location would not be able to open uh, without the variance. Um, after over a year of highly engaged planning with the neighborhood and community, the Town of Arlington issued the Neighborhood Action Plan for Arlington Heights, which uh, identified restaurant establishments as one of the most desired elements to the area and indicated it was a deficiency in the present state. Uh, in fact, the uh, report identified food and restaurants as the number one missing element from the Heights. 42% of the respondents indicated they would like to see a restaurant there. And because of the many remaining properties do not uh, have parking, this uh, desired use would be prevent prevented from uh, development. And while the 50-year-old zoning requirement is uh, limiting to the desired evolution of the neighborhood. Uh, one of the assets is that there exists uh, plentiful off-street parking for some of the more demanding locations, including D'Agostino's, Penzi's, and Capron Savings Bay. This frees up a lot of, of public parking uh, on the street and parking on the surrounding streets. Uh, it should be noted that since uh, our approval from the Redevelopment Board and Historical Commission, the applicants have leased uh, four spaces um, uh, behind the building. Uh, from landlord and multiple spaces from Arlington Coal and Lumber for staff. Uh, though anecdotally, because the applicants de desire to hire locally, many of the staff walk, bike, uh, or are dropped off. But the applicants wanted to find s staff spaces to make it easy for their staff, but also because those tend to be the spots that um, are kind of there for the entirety of their shift. So uh, that's something that was uh, something they wanted to focus on. Um, it, what is unique to the Heights Pub is that the majority of its customers will be coming to the Heights when many other businesses are closing. The parking impact will be minimized because of the operating hours. Uh, the applicants presently own First House Pub in neighboring Winchester and report that their lunch business counts for only about 20% of their overall customers. Uh, the Neighborhood Action Plan also discussed access to the Heights and the survey results indicated that 45% 
access the area by walking, while another 13% bike and 7% take the bus. So nearly 65% of the resident respondents um, don't <coughs> access the Heights by uh, car at all. Um, we expect those percentages to continue um, and uh, even uh, increase while the Heights um, uh, attracts more visitors. Uh, the applicants are committed to minimizing the impact of increased activity and have spoken with many of the neighbors to implement uh, plans to direct customers to public parking and away from private parking. Uh, and the economic development data presented uh, to us indicates that uh, the presence of a restaurant establishment uh, like the Heights Pub will increase activity to support existing businesses as well as new ones and become the kind of destination that Arlington desires. As you know, uh, Cafe Parada, uh, Olivio's and Flora have received exactly this kind of zoning, zoning relief from the board and uh, have become an example of how the area has room to grow and evolved with um, very well-intentioned uh, planning and relief. Um, uh, just specifically on the parking impact, uh, as I mentioned, three of the largest commercial establishments within a block radius, Cambridge Savings, D'Agostino's, um, um, and uh, 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 Penzi's Spices uh, have existing off-street parking, uh, and uh, which is, uh, uh, is more suitable for the demands of, of their businesses. The corner of Massachusetts and Avon Park Avenue, uh, formerly Brigham's, uh, held more than 20 seats, uh, which impact the parking, which does not now. Um, it's a Bennett family eye care location and has uh, limited hours of operation during daytime hours, so it's, uh, that use has, has shifted as well. Uh, public parking uh, along Park Avenue is more than sufficient to support the use. There are 29 spaces of two-hour parking, and it's typically available, uh, especially during the evening hours. Directly abutting Cambridge Savings Bank is Davis Road, one, uh, one, a one-way public road with additional parking, which does not affect any residential units uh, until uh, Surrey Road, so quite a bit of uh, uh, space there. In uh, front of the Heights and immediately across the street are at least 15 parking spaces along Massachusetts Avenue, which are frequently open and available during all hours, uh, daytime uh, or evening. Uh, I know that um, the Redevelopment Board and the Economic Development um, uh, plan that was submitted to you earlier um, has a lot, lot more uh, involved parking study um, that um, supports our conclusions. Um, so we're happy to answer questions um, at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, is the, is the, the town's um, traffic engineer here, is Dan here? Can you speak to the study that the town performed? Uh, if you could just come up so we make sure we catch you on the microphones. Okay. Can I have your name for the record, please? Sure. My name is Daniel Amstutz. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the town with the Department of Planning and Community Development. And so with the parking utilization study that I did, it's included with the, uh, the Department of Planning and Community Development's <laughs> report um, uh, regarding uh, the variance. And so um, I can go through it very briefly, just to say that um, I, so I went to the area, so, so we started looking at the area of 1314 Mass Ave and seeing, uh, to look at the parking utilization within the area, and we chose sort of a constrained, I would say a conservative bounds for uh, the map that's included with the report. Um, it's actually within about a thousand feet in each direction of the address, and um, which is actually a shorter distance than, say, a five-minute walk. So we tried to be conservative about the, the distance that somebody would park and walk from their car. And so I went out and created a map and estimated the number of spaces. We both counted the number of spaces that are already marked out there. There are some that are already marked on, on Park Ave, um, and then there are some handicapped spots that are already parked on Mass Ave, but most of the spaces are not marked uh, physically. So there's often more cars that can actually park on the street when they're not marked, because when you mark them, you, you give a, a larger buffer for that. So the, number, the estimated number of spaces that we created, again, was a conservative number. Um, and there's approximately 150 spaces within the bounds of, of the map that uh, is included with the report. And so I went there on three different occasions to do, um, they said count the number of vehicles that were parked in the area during the lunchtime period on a Monday and a Thursday and then on a Thursday evening. And generally overall, there was, um, again, within those bounds, there was not 
a, uh, not a total utilization of the parking capacity in the area. And especially on the evening time, it was much lower, perhaps 60% of the number of on-street parking spaces that we counted or, or estimated were actually being utilized at that time. So the, the, you know, the number of parking spaces during an evening would probably be around 70 or 60 that would be available again within this area that would be well within a five minute walk. Um, and we also included some information um, you know, partly from the neighborhood action plan that showed that the, the, bare, the radius of the five minute walk and how many people, or a 10 minute walk, and how many households would be within that area. So there are alternative means to get to this location besides driving. Does the board have a question specifically about the transportation, the parking plan? No. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. So the request is for a variance, and so for those of you in the, in the audience who aren't as familiar, um, we can grant special permits, which are for specific categories, but a variance is a different animal. Um, the requirements for a variance are written into state code. Um, they are not a local ordinance. And specifically, we have to make a number of findings. Um, the first is that owing to Circumstances related to the soil conditions, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, to a literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance or bylaw would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the partitioner or appellant. Three, that the desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. And number four, without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of such ordinance or bylaw. So those are the criteria that we need to evaluate this evening. Oh. And if I can add to that, I would just say that uh, for us, when we are asked to grant relief for a special permit, we have discretion. And I think that that's what Christian was alluding to. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the variance, we are really uh, pretty much hamstrung in terms of how we can decide. And unless we find those four criteria that have been satisfied, we actually can't grant the relief that's requested. And without getting into the weeds too much, I just want to let you know, and I direct a question um, to the applicant in a moment, but the variant statute was redone in 1975, and it said the Department of Community Affairs condemned a common substitute for the statutory Test. It said the temptation is to play the good fellow and substitute for tests specified in the statute and ordinance the following. Will the variance help the applicant and are the neighbors complaining? And, and so we're really well aware that a lot of people in the surrounding area are in favor of this. And I, as, uh, and I'm not going to speak for the rest of the members of the board, I have no objection to the idea of this. It's just how do we get there? And so that's my question to the applicant. And I don't know if you've seen a memorandum in opposition that was submitted by Attorney Falvey um, tonight. And just so you know, he, he cited that criterion that was set forth in the memorandum from the planning um, department. And in the planning department, and I think you cited actually in your materials as well, um, the question is how does this how does this satisfy the requirement that the conditions that you are trying to be relieved, seek relief from, are related to uh, soil conditions, shape, or topography? And so. Mr. Falvey, I know, is here and will probably speak to that. But his claim is that none of the facts citing, cited in the memo from the planning department actually uh, directed toward those issues. And so I would wonder if you could speak more directly to how you determined that those conditions are satisfied. Sure, thank you. 
Um, I, and I think that, uh, and I haven't seen uh, the memo. Yep. Um, and I um, uh, was not a part of the planning department's memo <coughs> either. We submitted our application in support. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, a two story block of uh, mixed uh, residential and commercial. Um, units and there's a uh, very limited private access to the building so the, the space that's actually under the applicants control um, and subject to the application uh, fronts Massachusetts Avenue and has a small access road to the rear of the building so there is no open space connected um, with the property and there will be no impact to the land uh, or structure or surrounding topography um, as a result of the variance so um, you know, unless there is uh, something that we're not aware of, um, there will be um, nothing um, that this uh, this variance um, would really in engage um, the topography or the soil conditions uh, at all. Um, it would be renovation uh, and use of an existing uh, interior building. Um, but the statute actually reads, <coughs> Soil condition shape topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district, which is located in that or structures is omitted from the, <coughs> from the other brief. Right. And so the question is still how does, how do the conditions related to soil conditions, topography, or lot shape? come into play in this particular petition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, can I suggest something? Absolutely. <clears throat> it's a little unfair to ask uh, Mr. Bettencourt essentially to reply to a memorandum that he <coughs> hasn't read Absolutely. Yet. And I wonder if it might be more sensible to hold this line of questioning a, a little bit more and give him an opportunity to see the memo and to decide what he'd like to say about it. But otherwise, he can't really focus on what it's claiming. And there's a certain degree of people talking past each other that might be fit, fixed if we uh, gave him a little time and had him come back when he's heard the argument and he knows exactly what he has to face. Certainly. Are there more questions from the board specifically to the Applicant before? Well, it depends if we're going to let him read the memo or not. So, well, I think we should absolutely, oh, I was going to say, we should let him, absolutely yeah. let him read so the memo. So if you want to suspend and come back after the, one more matter and keep going? Or, or do we want to, while well, he's reading this, do we want to entertain questions from the audience? That's a good idea. Roger, do you want to pass that around? Yeah. <clears throat> and then he can come back up. Right. Okay. All right, so we will, uh, we will take questions um, and comments from the, from the audience. Um, we ask that you be polite, um, address the board and not the applicants, um, and that you clearly state your name and address before you speak. And if you could come closer to the table, we don't have a specifically a microphone for uh, members of the audience, but I have been told that if you come close to the table, that you will be heard. Um, so if there's anyone who would like to Speak, please. Raise your hand, let me know. Please. I'm George Buckley, I'm a resident of Arlington, Renfrew Street. I'm a regular shopper in Arlington Heights. This is a wonderful idea for the wrong, wrong place. And my concerns are the amount of parking that's available in that area during the day would be severely impacted mm -hmm. if this establishment were to open. Furthermore, I worry about the number of deliveries that were required and where those deliveries might happen. I also worry, as an environmental manager and consultant, about where the food waste, the trash, and rubbish that would be produced from an establishment of this size in that area. Uh, most of the establishments in that area are small. They have a few people at a time that come and they go fairly quickly. Uh, this, this is a change of use, a major change of use in that area. Uh, Another worry is that as we see more and more people traveling by bicycle and scooter, where those might be put. So I see people having to deal with the dual issue here uh, with its volume, not just what's going to happen there. And then at some point in time, if they had takeout, what would happen with that and where that might go? Mm -hmm. And so the Heights is already very constrained if you go there most times uh, between 10 and 4 uh, or 5 in terms of the amount of use that happens there. 
Right. And, and your town uh, employee here was absolutely right. There's not much going on at night. Uh, but during the day, there's a lot going on. And it, it you know, varies from day to day, but it's heavily used. And I know when I go there, I have a hard time regularly finding parking, unless I'm up at the far end of Park Avenue, which, which for somebody with bad knees from hockey is not an easy <laughs> jog down the, down the bricks there. So that's my concern, is that, is that the impact on, on the, the, the public health and safety of people coming and going from that area, <coughs> and also, ultimately, on, on use of the sidewalks. Where, mm -hmm. where is stuff going to be put? And, and that is an extremely constrained area. And that's, that's the problem that you folks have, and that the people proposing this have, and that I see regularly as a user of Arlington Heights. Thank you. Thank you. So my understanding is that, uh, so the, we're only to, dis to discuss the parking. The, the use has already been approved by the Arlington Redevelopment Board. So this is sort of a two-part process. Um, the Arlington Redevelopment Board has authority over granting special permits for projects that occur on major arteries in town. So they have already uh, granted a special permit to the applicant to operate a restaurant in this location. They're coming to us solely for the purpose of the, the parking requirement. Um, but I believe in the agreement with the redevelopment board, there was a statement in regards to bicycle parking. Is that correct? That's right. Um, they are requiring us um, to uh, provide bicycle um, uh, parking in, uh, in front in the area around uh, the restaurant. So we've agreed to do that. So, um, and we will work with them on the appropriate location if we're um, you know, putting bike racks and things like that. So, ha so it may ha not be happy to do it. Right, so it may not be directly in front of the restaurant That's right. where the sidewalk is narrow, but it would be somewhere that can accommodate. Yeah, maybe up towards the corner as well where there's a little bit more, uh, more room. Um, so, okay. uh, and, and also just uh, because there are a lot of folks here that weren't here uh, for the redevelopment board, uh, we'll be handling deliveries and all trash behind the building so it won't impact the uh, you know, front of the building in Mass Ave at all. Um, so uh, there will be uh, a trash back there that is regularly picked up, um, so um, at, at least a few times a week. So um, that, that will all be handled and uh, is, is pretty highly restricted um, by the Board of Health as well and pretty um, highly um, managed. So. Thank you. Yes, please. Grant Cook, I live at 16 Wallace. And, um, <coughs> One off, I of course support this. I walked down to the bus in today and passed one maker there with no cars. There was a single car away at the bus stop. There were three cars on the street. Uh, it was a board. Um, but if you're talking about soil, behind that whole complex is a steep grade running up to the playground of the lock school. Uh, if you had to excavate that section, which is I think what you would need to do to put a parking lot somewhere to what was behind Prime or the Panera spot, you'd be be excavating 200 skips with the dirt you have to pull out of there to, to level that land behind there, and it will become a retainable nightmare. I mean, right now, I think at least it's somewhat of a erosion protection to let water running down that hill behind the complex. If you had to dig that out for parking, it would be a nightmare. I, I, I think uh, um, if you look at topography, having to build parking there would be an environmental chore. So, um, I really look forward to seeing this restaurant open. And, I would, I personally, from my place, dealing with both people parking in front of my home, which I love because I don't own the street, and walk, and my family and I would walk to this restaurant, restaurant uh, like as were most of my neighbors. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Tom Allen. I live at 251 Lowell Street. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my wife, who's at home watching the kids right now. Um, <coughs> but I just want to be in favor of the board granting this variance. Um, we live in the Mount Yobo neighborhood, I see a number of my neighbors here. Um, we anticipate walking to this restaurant, and we have had many discussions with many of our neighbors about how nice it would be to have a place that was within walking distance where we could gather and we could get together for dinner or have a drink. And so I'd like to very strongly urge the board to consider the fact that there are many people within walking distance who patronize this business on a regular basis without any effect to the parking. Thank you. We do have five more hearings after this, so we, we want to try to keep it moving. Uh, there's a gentleman back here in a hat who raised his hand quickly. Yes, sir. <coughs> 
So I just want to uh, support the gentleman who just. Uh, Can I have your name, please, for the record? Oh, my name is David Harding. I live in one, one wire in the place. <coughs> I just want to support the uh, gentleman who just uh, uh, spoke. I'm actually a regular customer of, uh, of the uh, locale in Winchester, where I go, where I drive over there, so <coughs> that my friends can actually walk uh, uh, close by. So I'd like the opportunity to be able to walk my local pub. And in that sense, right, it would be a very good uh, uh, addition to the neighborhood. A neighborhood that's um, in transition at this moment. There's a lot of places that are that are closing down. And it would be very good to uh, see the, the neighborhood come up with a local like this. The gentleman here. <coughs> uh, Marvin Lewinton, 18 West Street, longtime resident of the Heights and longtime walking patron of many of the establishments in the Heights. Um, Dagestino's, Trader Joe's, Brigham's when it was around, um, my favorite hardware store. Um, and, you know, many of my neighbors also walk. Um, I think it would be great, as other you know, conscious have said, to have something that we can walk to. The Heights has, you know, the, the town has wanted to have two thriving business districts, the East, the Center, and the Heights. Um, the Heights does not have something right now like this that would bring a lot of people in. And I think that would be really important given the number of establishments that have closed over the years. Uh, and in terms of parking, you know, the restaurants in the East seem to be doing fine without dedicated parking. I don't see why the Heights can't have the same kind of opportunity. So I would like to keep it. Other speakers again. Okay. Um, there's a microphone. If you could just approach slightly and speak loud. Uh, Owen Callahan, <coughs> I'm on uh, 4 Westmoreland Avenue. And I just want to speak a little bit in support of it as well. I've been in the Heights since 1996, regular walker, etc. I, am, in addition to, I'm sure hundreds of people that aren't here tonight, would walk to this establishment. Um, I think that given some of the establishments that have come in and out of Arlington Heights, um, that we've seen come and go, I see the storefronts that are vacant. Uh, it's a big complaint in Arlington in general. Um, I think that the Arlington Heights community deserves such an establishment. I hear that we're going to get a CBD establishment. I don't know how many parking exemptions that's going to need. But I think that some place like this that the community, the entire community could gather would be of value to the community and something that would draw us together as a community even further. So, mm -hmm. thanks. Excuse me. Have you had an opportunity to um, I, I haven't. I mean, I, I guess I'm not really sure what to do at this point. I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm trying to listen to, okay. um, you know, uh, who is speaking here so, uh, so I can respond as I have been doing to questions. Um, you know, having, uh, you know, I, I object to, you know, receiving this uh, at such a late date that this was submitted um, right before the hearing and I'm supposed to process this and respond to it live while there's testimony um, from residents. Um, so, um, and I, I, I mean, I, I get the intention of doing that, um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that what would be more appropriate is if we would have a response, uh, have the ability uh, after the hearing to submit a written response to this if the uh, board feels that that would be appropriate. I, I just want to say, I apologize, I wasn't trying to catch you short, but the question that I posed that is in the memorandum was precisely the question that I came into this hearing with tonight. So that was the question I was going to ask regardless of where it was located, because it's really yep. the basic element in requesting a variance, and it still needs to have a connection to the soil condition, topography, or lot shape. And so, again, you know, that's something that I think that was spelled out in the memorandum from the planning department. So that's something that I thought that, you know, your um, application would address. And so that's really what I was just trying to get at. I wasn't trying to get yeah. at the I mean, we did address. I mean, we did address it in the application. I mean, uh, there, there is um, uh, very um, little impact and connection to any um, change in the, the soil or topography there. You know, we have a uh, existing um, building um, and uh, we are not touching the exterior. Um, the structure is all interior improvements. We are not making any structural improvements whatsoever. Um, and, uh, you know, anything that we're be that's being done on the facade of the building um, uh, is really aesthetic and improvements and has been approved by the Historical Commission at this point. So, um, but uh, I, I uh, I'm not sure um, exactly, um, you know, 
what you would be looking for. I, I think it was mentioned by one of the residents here that the impact of us adding uh, parking uh, uh, to the back of the building, um, it would be nearly impossible and wouldn't be something that would be economically feasible. Um, and that's, so that, that's part of uh, the request for the variance is that it, um, it would really keep, uh, you know, if there's any sort of um, restaurant or food establishment ever in this location, uh, it would not be feasible for anybody to, uh, to open that if they were having to do, you know, any, you know, adding parking to the, to the property. Uh, it's just, it's really, uh, it's really quite impossible. But I think you'd have to have ownership or control over the property that you say you couldn't use for parking. And I don't know that you presented that as an element of your application. Because I don't know who owns that property, so while it may be true that you couldn't, without you know, some massive effort and expenditure of money, be able to uh, cut parking into there, I don't know that that's part of the property and part it, of what it's, your application It's not. I mean, it's, the, the, any, any area um, that w where we would have to extend into is, is, not, is not owned and is not leased as part of our uh, as part of the property. So it, it is the property outline is in our variance application um, and it showed in there, uh, in, even if we wanted to purchase uh, the property behind us, the land behind us, uh, it would not be feasible um, to, and certainly would be uh, a major kind of impact uh, on the economic viability of the, the project. So Understood. To, to require the purchase of that property in order to blast and uh, you know try to get permitting for it. So, uh, so you your head up? Sorry. I did, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, Angie Hazard, 277. Uh, Angie Hazard, 277 Oakland Avenue. And I echo a lot of what everybody has said in support of getting the variance. I just wanted to add that since 2016, I've been part of a group that's kind of galvanized in the height to try and revitalize the area. We started with grassroots meetings, talking about what the Heights needs, and the pub always has come up since 2016. And this is the first time that I've seen a business owner that can come in and has the you know, money to in significantly invest in a location in the Heights. I've, I've had I've heard of other businesses who were interested, but they haven't been able to you know, work with the landlords. And this is the first time that we've gotten this far, and I just think it would be a shame not to do everything that we can to try and help them. author of the memorandum that you know, Mr. Benton Court's currently reviewing. Apologize for not having it prepared earlier, but I just completed it this afternoon. But in essence, uh, our position has uh, been a, basically articulated by the board. Uh, I represent uh, Sam D'Agostino, <coughs> D'Agostino's Delicatessen, Paul Stanton at Sports, etc. And they have no opposition to the character of the business that's being proposed or the character of the petition. Um, you know, I have a very high regard for Mr. O'Rourke and first pub and it's no issue with respect to the nature of what is going to take place there. The specific questions concern the parking. Uh, and it has been indicated that the uh, current zoning bylaw requires for, you know, uh, it is going to require 16 parking spaces for a restaurant of this size. And we currently have none. And as been uh, pointed out by Mr. DuPont, the uh, there is nothing in the petition that suggests that this is a problem as a result of the shape of the lot, the topography of the lot, or the soil content. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of what violence will be done to those things if this uh, restaurant takes place. It's that's the criteria that's necessary to come here and ask for a variance for the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And if, if there's a problem with that, the appropriate <coughs> remedy may be to re-examine the amount of parking spaces required for an enterprise like that, so that this, this is not a problem, but currently it is. And there is nothing in the, in the traffic impact study that would suggest what my clients are supposed to do with people who are going to avail themselves and currently constantly avail themselves of their parking lot that they privately pay for and privately maintain and it's not a problem because it's used for 15, <coughs> 10 minute, five minute visits to local businesses. 
But when someone now spends two hours dining, it's a challenge where they'll be forced to be vigilant in maintaining their parking that they pay for, that they maintain, that they bargain for. And it'll be present a problem with their current and prospective customers <coughs> that are unnecessary. Uh, we, we have no problem with a restaurant coming to the Heights, and uh, that would be great. But they're asking for a variance of uh, a requirement of 16 parking spaces, but frankly, there is zero. It's one thing if it were 9 to 10 and what have you, but this is, it's, it's not close to what we need, and the criteria that's been pointed up at the board is not met. In the, in the language in, uh, in Section 10 of 40A, um, it does say land, but it also says structures. And I'm sort of curious how you, so the, the, it specifically says, owing to the circumstances related to the soil condition, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district. So I'm curious if that <coughs> reference specifically to structures on the... I don't know what the structure has to do with the amount of parking. And mm -hmm. we're not here to address the, 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 the nature of the structure. We're here because there is a lack of parking spaces. And the criteria, which the, 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 the Community Development Board mentions, but really doesn't address, mm -hmm. is it doesn't talk about the soil. It doesn't talk about the shape of the lot, which is perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. It just says that there's no room for parking in front of it. And there isn't, because there's a structure on it. Mm -hmm. And if you knock down the structure, I'm not sure you get 16 parking spaces there. It's just we, as a town, have a bylaw that requires 16 parking spaces for 70 seat restaurant. Mm -hmm. And we're asking it to be ignored. And they're asking the board to contort itself into a position where it pretends that there's a problem with the soil, or the, or, or the shape of the lot, or the, the, the regular geographical disposition of the property. And there isn't any. We know there's not. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if I could. Uh, so, uh, and we did meet with um, many of the neighbors, including uh, Sam D'Agostino, about this, who was concerned about his parking, as was indicated by Mr. Fahey. Um, they have an existing issue with people um, using uh, their, um, their parking um, when they're going to other businesses um, and they choose not to enforce it. We would be happy to, and we have uh, indicated this to them, that we would be very clear with our patrons uh, that they will be um, receive a ticket or they will be towed if they park in private lots. And we will identify those lots in particular. Um, I uh, would be remiss if I did not say that, I mean, I feel like that the this argument is a circular one and, and really pretextual for what we're dealing with with the parking issue. There is um, parking available there that is public parking and that is not just to serve D'Agostinos. That is to serve the residents of Arlington. And let me say, I know that you know they've had a, a, a long commitment to the town, and they've been in that location for a long time, and they run a successful business, and I go there myself. Uh, and I also uh, live in Winchester, where uh, there is a D'Agostinos there as well. And I remember when we were proposing uh, a farmer's market in the center of town, and uh, there was one extremely vocal uh, uh, opposition to, uh, to that uh, farmer's market, uh, and it was the same issue. It was D'Agostinos. They said, you're going to take all our parking, and we're going to go out of business. We opened the farmer's market, and soon thereafter, they doubled the size of their business. Uh, this is how economic development works. This is what it looks like when you improve it. Um, are there other people have something to say that's significantly different than what we've already heard? Um, and I only say that because we do still have five other cases coming up for us. Sir? Uh, my name is Joel Oliver. I live in 62 Wallstown Avenue. I guess. An alternative way to perhaps frame the parking issue is would there be a creative solution whereby these other businesses or other parking lot owners might be able to work out some sort of a rental, you know, pay, paid parking um, solution where certain spots in their lots were at certain hours dedicated to 
to pub, pub, pub uh, customers. So it could be a potentially revenue generating thing as opposed to a net loss. I can't get up to so in, I mentioned before uh, in my early remarks, um, uh, we have uh, negotiated uh, the lease of um, a total of six parking spaces uh, for Arlington Cole and uh, four from the landlord behind the building. Um, there, uh, and I wanted to respond as well to Mr. Fahey's uh, argument regarding uh, the, uh, the soil and the structure. Um, the soil is, um, is concrete or asphalt, um, and the building, uh, it, for us to remove the building from that location, I don't think was the uh, intent of uh, the zoning um, uh, direction to us in, to, in the bylaw. So um, I think that we're getting far afield from what we're doing if we're looking to require buildings to be demolished in order to provide parking. And I don't think it's a modern understanding of uh, <laughs> Last year, and then we'll move on. Sure. Sure. So, uh, Jared Lansberger, 29 Florence Ave. Can, can you step up, please? Sure. Thank you. Jared Lansberger, 29 Florence Ave. I guess I have a question about what kind of discretion this group has within this, right? So, do you have some criteria for decision? And I thought earlier we were talking about discretion. So, so uh, there's been studies done. We heard from the traffic uh, advisor. Uh, there was a May 23rd, 2018 uh, group. Uh, visioning session up at the Dallin. I'm in the Dallin. I participated in that session. I heard very loud and very clearly from the community, as we are here today, that this is specifically asked for by the community. And so I ask, you know, what, aside from these criteria that's written into the Massachusetts law, we in Massachusetts have a very strong sense of home rule uh, where the local communities can make decisions for themselves. And I ask what kind of discretion you guys are able to make when you hear the community coming out in this size. Um, and, and volume saying that they want this use, what can you do uh, to deal with these criteria and, uh, and allow the community to have what, it, you know, what it's asking for um, and intends to uh, make, make feasible in its space? Thanks. Sure. So, uh, Sean and Roger, I don't know if either of you want to I'm happy to answer address that. that question. Um, and I'm glad you asked it because, um, you know, my opinion, I agree wholeheartedly with what everybody said in support of this, totally. But here's the discretion we have, and it's extremely limited, so we're in a huge bind. The town bylaw, which was just passed again recently by town meeting, says four spots per, you know, need 16 spots for this. The only way around that is to meet the requirements in the variant statute, and I encourage everybody here to read it. Roger talked about it in the beginning, Christian, chapter 40A, section 10. And that has four specific requirements that have to be met in order for us to do anything. And they don't even necessarily talk about parking. They really involve lot shape and things like that. They involve financial hardship, substantial hardship to the petitioner if it's not granted. Um, substantial detriment to the public good and without getting away from the intent or purpose of the bylaw. So, and if you look at some of the cases, which I did, the cases, because if either part, if anybody's unhappy with this and you have standing, you can appeal it to court. And some of these cases go up and appeal, and they say, failing to meet any one of the varying requirements is fatal to the petition. Um, all of the requirements must be met before the, the zoning board. Substantial hardship can't just be personal to the applicant. It has to be something that affects that parcel. It's supposed to allow people that have odd shaped lots and things like that come before us. We hardly ever see requests for variants because they're so hard. They're so hard and we're really limited. So um, speaking for myself, it's a great idea. Great idea. The problem is with the zoning bylaws passed by town meetings say you can't do it without the parking. We have to go to that state statute, and that says they have to come in here and meet all of those requirements. If they don't meet one, we don't have discretion. That's the problem, because this is a great idea. So, you know, we hope to continue to hear more, and if council, you want to address any of those. Um, sure, I, I mean, I, I think that um, this has come up in context of, you know, again, um, uh, Mr. D'Agostino's submission through council. 
Um, and um, I, I think that uh, in, in our application, in support of our application that you have received, mm -hmm. um, uh, we did address uh, those issues. So um, this is, um, a, a, again, I mean, there, there is um, nothing with this property. Uh, there's no additional lot space that we can use. We, we have, uh, with the landlord, uh, made an effort and agreed and leased additional spaces to squeeze them in the back. Uh, but again, uh, there is uh, the way that this lot uh, is shaped in the back uh, is uh, completely limiting for us to provide that parking. It is impossible. Um, and the only way would be for us to uh, take down a substantial portion of the building uh, in order to provide parking and we wouldn't be able to get the required amount. So uh, I think that there's a level of impossibility there. Um, there is no, um, the, because it is uh, in the middle of a block, there's uh, no availability for us to use any of the uh, side setbacks either. There is nothing there. It's wall to wall. Uh, and the front is on Massachusetts Avenue, which is uh, all concrete and uh, not space that we have control over. So uh, I think this is uh, exactly consistent with the, with the prior um, uh, approval of variances that have happened for um, Olivio's and with Flora and um, is, is really in the spirit of um, what the um, uh, the, the, the bylaw indicates. I mean, it, it's uh, um, this is exactly uh, the kind of thing that is uh, um, referenced in that in that first part. I mean, uh, I I don't know if you have other questions about the soil or anything else that I could uh, you know explain to you on that. I I wouldn't know what else to provide. I mean, it's uh, um, I think it's pretty clear that the the lot and the space is <clears throat> is completely limited. So if I could, I would like to echo what Sean said. I think it's a great idea. So again, and I feel that we are, we do have our hands tied because of the language of the statute. And if we thought that you met the requirements, and again, it's in my mind, the soil condition, the lot shape or the topography. So in, in my view, and just so other people understand, if there was actually a change to the zoning bylaw where it permitted this relief to be granted by special permit, which is where the board actually has discretion to make a determination based upon the things that you're all saying here tonight. That would be another matter altogether. It's just that the variance is so restrictive that we do have our hands tied. So that's the concern, and I'm certainly not personally opposed to the idea. It's just, what does the statute say? Do, do you have your hands tied, though? Yeah. Because what I'm wondering is, is, is it's not black and white. No. Yeah. I mean, who's interpreting the, the violence? Right? So you are. And the attorney is. Can we not shout over each other, please? So, Thank you. So it's a matter of interpretation, right? So, so he reads it one way, and you read it another way. Um, and, and I'm certainly not an attorney. Um, but it seems like you do have discretion because you are interpreting it one way versus another. And it sounds like this precedent, which we really should hear about. Could you come up there just a moment? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Casa and I live at 62 Wollaston Avenue and I'm not an attorney either and I'm very much in support of the business and looking forward to walking down and heartbroken that the Heights is really a wasteland right now. Total wasteland. Uh, what time of year you're there, you can park anywhere you want. But will most people here live within walking distance? But um, this gentleman mentioned that there's been a precedent of variances being passed with Flora and Olivia and Olivio's, and I'd like to hear more about that. And I think maybe that's an avenue I know that is definitely uh, would be considered if there was an appeal as an appropriate path forward. So I'd like to know more about that. And thank you for mentioning that. Sure. So I don't know if we know anything specific about when those were. Yeah, I'm not sure. Past. There was somebody in the back who was making a comment before who I'd love to have them make their comment. Hi. You're going to speak loudly. Sorry, Danielle, the Circle. I, in the scheme of everyone here, I feel fairly new to Arlington a couple of years, but just in hearing, I, I understand feeling like your hands are tied, but it does kind of sound like when we're talking about discretion, it sounds like the structure is 
you know, has buildings on either side. There's cement, you know, so if you are thinking that your hands are tied, maybe articulating to us what they haven't fulfilled in their, I don't know what it's called, application, because it sounds like they're saying the lot, the size, the way it's positioned, the structure, which I think was left out of the memo or whatever was just um, filed, but it sounds like they actually are fulfilling some of those really hard requirements in the in what you need to get a variant. So I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm hearing that it's difficult, but I'm not understanding what they haven't fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Economic hardship is clear. I mean, the hardship, the financial hardship, the way the structure is, the fact that there are things on both sides. I think you, this first person articulated that even if they bought the land, the way it's, um, the topography, all, all that stuff, it sounds like they're, they're saying, aside from all of our emotional feelings, that we, we want some great um, restaurant there, they actually have fulfilled what you're asking them to fulfill, improving that um, they meet the criteria for the, for the variance. Try to The, the problem that Mr. Fahey has raised is a problem that uh, exists even if the parking solution is satisfactorily done. In other words, even if everything that was said in the report by the town is correct and there isn't a parking problem, uh, that by itself doesn't get you where you need to go. In the application, it says to describe the circumstances relating to the soil conditions, shape, or topography, which especially affect the land or structure in question. And the difficulty is that the state doesn't provide, in general, for a relief from the conditions of the zoning ordinance just because of hardship. Hard, only some kinds of hardship count. And the answer that we have here, and it's only three sentences in the application, do not really address the way in which soil conditions, shape, or topography create the hardship that we all agree is there. And so the problem that we have under state law that hasn't, to my satisfaction, that has not been addressed yet is how it is you can relate the hardship that we know is there to the particular circumstances which allow us to take that hardship into account. And this is all sort of moved. I, I know that it was there in the original variance criteria, the, in the application, but there there isn't really an argument. There's just simply a statement of, uh, that is similar to what you've heard. The planning department also does not really address this issue. It just sort of assumes that hardship by itself would be enough. Uh, there is a question about how it is that this would relate to the underlying structure. Now, this is a really important issue to the people in Arlington Heights. And it's one that I would like to see actually developed in writing that focuses hard on exactly what it is that has to be proven and that addresses the other precedents that are said to exist and why it is that this is different from them so that I understand that if I want to do something that I would like to do, I would like to say yes to this, that I can do that without violating my obligation under the law. Mm -hmm. And we have not got that developed at this point. Uh, I have the feeling that if we were to have to proceed on the basis of the record we have right now, it would be very difficult for us to be able to articulate the rationale that would allow us to do this. And just saying that, well, of course you can't build parking on, on the site doesn't answer the problem. It just helps you get to the problem. And so I would like to see this record develop more. I'd like to hear answers to some of the questions that people are asking. And I would like to see somebody take their ver very best shot at providing a rationale to this board that says that we all can do what most of us, maybe all of us, would really like to have done. Mm -hmm. But we, we have to do this within the framework that state law provides. And the state law that provides this is deliberately set up in such a way that hardship by itself doesn't matter. So 
the applicant obviously has control over what he wants to do, what they, what they want to do next. Uh, I'd hate to have to decide this tonight based upon the record that, that we have. Uh, I don't think that it is developed enough and that there's been enough concentration on what the critical legal issue is. Uh, and the applicant, I think, has ways of, of, uh, uh, of helping to provide that Im improved record. Uh, but I would be very skeptical about our ability to move forward in the way that, we, you, that most people here would like um, based on the record that we have before us. Thank you. And, and we, we would um, be happy to provide additional information if we would continue uh, the hearing and supplement. And I think it's uh, fair in light of just receiving, uh, you know, uh, this memo on this specific issue. Um, just to let you know from the, the precedent that uh, I had referenced to the other uh, approved restaurant establishment, um, we presented um, our argument in the very same way uh, and with almost identical fact patterns. Um, so it is uh, a little bit of a surprise to have this uh, additional requirement and I would appreciate uh, the zoning board directing us to the information that they would like us to provide additionally uh, because we it's very much uh, in line with, uh, if not identical, to the other applications that were submitted and approved for variance. Mm -hmm. So you've seen the applications that were applied for the other Yes, and the decisions of the board, of the zoning okay. board. So, uh, so it and uh, it was um, uh, and and the the, the discussion uh, around the buildings was the, the limitation of the, the concrete structure and the uh, the frontage and the, the um, you know being mid block and uh, very uh, very much similar. As I said, uh, uh, well, I think the floor was exactly seventy seats that they were looking for as well, and we were approved parking. So um, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what else we could provide, but I would need to look a little bit more deeply into um, what was responded to. And this is actually a response that was provided not to our application, but to the planning department's um, uh, uh, memorandum in support of it. So um, uh, they um, have referenced things and they have noticed deficiencies that are not deficiencies in our application. But with that said, if we were to continue the hearing, if that is the pleasure of the zoning board, I would be happy to supplement our application um, for the variance and, um, and, and answer that particular issue well, or others. A, okay. hey, let, me, let me take a stab at, a, at this here. So this area specifically was developed around streetcars and the train. So there was a, the train stop at Park Ave. Um, so this area was developed before cars. Uh, or when cars were pretty infrequent. And when the bylaw, when we did the first big round of zoning in 1975, there was an, you know, an attempt to try to reconcile the fact that we do have parking requirements now. And so all the spaces on Mass Ave all of a sudden <clears throat> are there and they don't have parking spaces. So what do you do? So my understanding is that the, at the time the decision was made to essentially assume that each storefront on Mass Ave has the equivalent of forced parking spaces associated to it. Um, and that going forward, if when you do a change of use, you're required to meet the new, the requirements for the new use. Um, and so this storefront was granted four spaces. Um, but, you know, the, obviously the building was not built with that in mind. And that whole district was not built with that in mind. Um, and so when you look at the, when you consider sort of the, the shape of the building and the way that the lots are developed and you consider the topography of how that area is laid out, there are, there are places that do have the ability to park. Um, so it's not, you know, this, this is, it's not every single space in the entire district. So it's not a general issue with the district, but a lot of the properties do have this issue that they do not have access to parking because it was not a consideration at the time the building was developed. Um, so if we accept that, that the reason that the circumstance of shape and topography is related to the historic development of the area and that the, those structures were developed with a primarily pedestrian and, and rapid transit bent to them and not automotive, then can we say that that is a circumstance related to 
the shape and topography of the structures, which is a part of that criteria, and use that as a way to validate going forward to the literal enforcement provisions or desirable relief and the nullification. Because this is gonna, yeah, this is every single site. And if this building, if this had been a hairdresser's originally and we, and Balix wanted to open, Balix would need to provide 20 parking spaces. That's what the zoning bylaw requires now. Um, and there's no way they would ever need 20 parking spaces. So I would contend. No. And so I would certainly contend that we could say that the circumstance relating to soil condition, shape, and topography of land or structures, especially affecting land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district, is that this is an area that was not developed for automotive access and that that is the condition of shape and topography that would move us into position of considering granting a variance. Christian, you were that just came out yep. and, and was passed by town meeting. Was there a discussion ever about this requirement? Because that stayed in place, is that what happened? Right, so the recodification process, um, we very specifically tried to not change the, change what the outcome of zoning would be from the previous to the new. We were basically doing a cleanup, a, working through it, so that um, it was a clean slate, so that we could then make amendments afterwards related to these kinds of things. And so since then, there have been some very well publicized um, plans put forward by the ARB in terms of uh, multi-use and other kinds of things to try to uh, change the, some of the density requirements and change some of the parking requirements in town. I guess my question to the board is do we want to consider the what I was talking about in terms of condition one or do we want the applicant to reconsider and request a continuance and come back? Do any uh, board members or maybe council, assuming the chair, we accept the chair's argument on the first prong of the variance, you then get to substantial hardship to the petitioner. And I don't know if you've read the cases on it, but they talk about that financial hardship going forward for him if he opens this would not be the issue. It's gotta be existing. Typically, if somebody has owns a lot of land, they can't use it at all. So what's your argument for financial hardship, assuming you get past the first argument here? Um, well, I, I think, uh, as the acting chair had mentioned, the, um, there is a hardship to um, this property that is uh, under uh, lease uh, by my client, and uh, there, um, there would still it would there would be an impossibility um, on this lot for that um, to have anything. And, and uh, if uh, Balik was coming in, uh, they would be required to having uh, the the spaces that do not exist there as well. So it's not just that it is a, a restaurant in there, even that's, even though that's what the community has told us they want. Um, it, is a, uh, it, it is a hardship uh, for that property um, indefinitely. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think it is uh, consistent with the, with the other um, uh, elements that have been um, discussed uh, and survived the other applications and variances that were issued by this board. So essentially the hardship is that 
whatever use was assigned to the property when the bylaw went in place in 1975, that use cannot be changed. That's right. And that would be the that would be the hardship for the property. That's right. Because that would not relate to. See, one of the other impediments here, though, is that it has to be not only related to the soil condition, shape, or topography, um, but it has to. It cannot affect generally the zoning district. It has to be specific to the property <coughs> mm -hmm. in question. Well, certainly the people across the street have a parking lot. Cambridge right, but, Savings Bank has, a, but, has access to parking. But everybody on that strip, arguably, if they were changing use, has the same issue. That is true. So, so, so typically, just so the people here understand, what we're usually looking at for a variance is that somebody has a lot and they want to build their garage, but they can't put it in the place it would normally be because there's a whole bunch of ledge, but nobody else in the neighborhood has ledge. So they come into us and they say, it, this condition doesn't affect generally the district, but it affects us and we would like to actually move it closer to the lot line. And those are obviously much more concrete examples. And those were a, a little bit easier for us to envision and to deal with. I think the problem here is partly because we have what Christian has described as these sort of uh, throwback uh, building designs from before you know, cars were being widely used but we still have that language about how do you associate uh, your particular problem with the landscape topography or soil condition. And as Patrick had said earlier, that's where I think we all struggle because if we all like the idea, we still feel that we have to satisfy those criteria. And that's where I don't honestly see that those have been addressed uh, substantially enough and you know that's I'll speak for myself mm -hmm. <coughs> I agree I mean it'll just be thrown back at us yeah so at this point would we recommend to the applicant that we continue and they work on there we would be happy to and as I said I think that um, you know as there's been additional issues and uh, in response to um, the first criteria um, we can supplement our applications in response to your questions and in response to um, this uh, um, memorandum as well mm -hmm. and can I ask too because I know that we should have access to them but you have noted as one of the speakers said the cases of Olivio and Flora. Yep. I didn't see those in the materials. Okay. And if those are provided, that would also be something that I would like to take a look at. Absolutely. And, and if uh, we could be provided with a little bit more direction on the, the, um, the soil conditions, as I mentioned, it's, uh, and we will provide the, the case support for this. Uh, it was not otherwise um, heavily um, discussed in the other cases. Um, right. And so it was um, the least impactful one um, from my reading. Um, and uh, I, you know, uh, so I'm happy to provide you with anything else. Uh, the lot is what it is and mm -hmm. you know, we won't be able to uh, make up anything that isn't there. But um, you know, if there's direction on what you're looking for, we can certainly provide it. Can I make a final comment? <coughs> sure. Step up. Hi, you, can, just step up so we can hear you, sorry. Hi, my name is Claudine Swartzland. I live at 29 Valentine Road. I have to say, everyone, my head is totally spinning because it doesn't feel like we're spending enough energy. I appreciate, Christian, your efforts in terms of how to get to yes. This issue is an issue that <coughs> surpasses this zoning board, which is dealing with the parking issue. This is about us in Arlington showing some leadership and figuring out how we can all work together to satisfy everybody's concerns. Sam's concerns are legitimate. You know, and he's a valued part of the community as well as, you know, the hockey institution. What we need to do is to sit a few people in the room, smart people, to figure out how we get to yes. And then leave there with a the plan. Rather than doing a continuance, making this poor gentleman wait another month, draw out his expenditures. <laughs> I 
ridiculous. So, I mean, I really hope that we leave here today. I don't know if it's the planning commission. I don't know if it's the town manager. I don't know if it's town council. council. But really saying, we are going to figure out a way to make a commitment to businesses that want to come in Arlington yes. and make it work. Yes. We waited for three years. make sure that there was a spot that could accommodate a restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. And so we really don't want to leave here tonight with A, a no vote, mm -hmm. B, with a continuous thing I call this individual more challenges. What we want to leave here with is a sense of the collective community as an action plan to address this issue. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your leadership, but I do hope it comes up even a level higher than the zoning board to, gr to get mm -hmm. everyone together. Thank you for your time. speak to it effectively. When you say they'll throw it back at you, who is the they? Yeah, at the state level. And what are they throwing back? So essentially, <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, so, um, so once we reach our decision, um, any decision reached by the board is appealable within a 20-day period. Uh, that appeal goes to land court, I believe, is the first stop. Um, and then to from there, it goes to Supreme Judicial or whatever. So essentially, any decision, any decision reached by the zoning board on anything um, the Arlington Redevelopment Board as well, is appealable um, through the court system. And so what, uh, what Sean, Mr. O'Rourke was sort of saying here is that, you know, there, there is a lot of precedence in the court system for zoning boards, you know, saying, you know, this is great, we'll give you a variance, we think this is a great idea, and then it gets to the courts, and the first thing the courts say is, well, you didn't meet the criteria, and they immediately reverse the decision. Um, and there is a there's a lot of, unfortunately, there's a lot of history in the, in the court system for that. So that's why we're trying to be really careful, because we really want to be, be sure that whatever decision we make can stand and we can defend it. If I can just add one word to that. And yes, that please. That, that what I hope that we can get out of this, and which I think the lawyers need to go back and look at the cases too, is I would like us to have a defensible theory mm -hmm. for why it is the appellate bodies will affirm this. Because if we don't have that, it'll, it isn't going to make this, this restaurant established any faster. I have the sense that it's likely to be appealed unless you work it out af afterwards and, dry, and the appeal is dropped. And if that doesn't happen, and if we don't have anything except the fact that we all want what you all want to go on, that's exactly when they send it back to us, and then and then it's over with at that point. So, with all the leadership in the world, when you have an appellate court, there's only so much you can do. And what I would like, what I would hope to have, is something that I can look at that would say, okay, this is the theory. This is how those first two two provisions, the first two criteria, are satisfied, and that is a that's a, a fairly arguable theory that we've got a chance to get to get by the courts. And I don't feel that, I mean, I think that Christian, the, the chairman was, has got something and it might be helpful. It also might be helpful to find out more about what the thinking was in the other cases so that you have a whole skein of cases that applies, uh, that applies elsewhere in Arlington as well. I don't really actually know where that's going to come out, but at the end of the day, in order for us to, to do what I would like to be able to do, we have to have at least a fairly arguable, a fairly arguable theory as to why it is this meets the this meets the uh, uh, <clears throat> this meet, meets the requirements of the statute. Now I notice that if only the <clears throat> town meeting in its ineffable, sometimes ineffable wisdom, uh, would have made this a special exception, a special permit use, we would not have this problem. We would have had, we would have been out of here an hour ago, yep. uh, but we don't. We do have this problem because this is a very, very. It's, it's a it's an it, it's a very very uh, tiny opening in the needle, and that's what state law wanted. It was just to get rid of people for whom it would be totally unfair, uh, because of some kinds of matters that the state looked at mm -hmm. that gives you relief, and it isn't a general discretionary relief that allows us to do it because it would be a good idea. And that's what we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. 
And so you have, you have, just to be clear, so you say you've contracted for 10 spaces? Um, so we have uh, six spaces. Six spaces. Six spaces. The, the other question I have for you is how far back, I know you said that there's a plan there, yep. but how far back does the property actually extend behind the rear of the building? It, it's the land owned by whoever. So there's a there's a parcel. there's a, a a very small um, access road behind there, right. um, which is where we would uh, take deliveries, um, uh, which would still be very difficult to do, uh, and we would store trash and things like that. And then it is uh, it is ledge and it is area that we wouldn't be able to. But do you know how far yeah. back the lot line goes? It not far at all. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it, uh, just uh, 20 feet back from the back of the rear of the property. But you have the whole length of the building, right? Well, no, it's an access. We no, we only have the middle block of the building. No, no. But I'm just saying that that parcel is owned by. So it's owned from the bank, right? No. No. All the way back. Whoever no. who are those individually owned? That whole yes. The, the yes. Stores. yes. Those are individually owned. So we. That's what I was saying. We I only okay. we only have access to the middle block middle block of there. So. Um, you know, we can't, even if we wanted to, pile a bunch of cars in the back access road because we, we only have easement rights to it, um, so, um, behind the other buildings, um, so. Um, and you're saying that it's ledge? Um, it, yeah, it is, it is, and I think there's actually brook behind there as well, um, so it would be difficult for, uh, as I said, more than difficult, it would be uh, impossible for us to uh, do anything, uh, and, uh, and again, we would have to get rights to the area behind us because uh, uh, in order to do that, to put those spaces, so. Um. I mean, ultimately, the determination of whether you want to continue this is really yours, right? So, I mean, but based upon the comments of the board thus far, do you wish to have a continuance, I guess, is the Yes, question. that would be the pleasure of the board. I think that um, we'd be happy to supplement our application with additional information. Um, and uh, certainly, um, as I mentioned, we responded to the application in full and um, focused on the elements from the prior cases that were really um, uh, heavily alluded to, and there was a lot of reasoning behind. And the, the soil conditions, um, I mean, th that was not one of them. You right. know? So um, we are, this, it's a little bit of a surprise, and I'm still a little unsure how we respond to that, but we will cert certainly make an effort to. Um, you know, my concern is, um, as one of the comments was made, uh, it's, a, it's an additional uh, expense, and delay is an expense for um, uh, my client, um, and it, it will have a chilling effect on other businesses that are responding um, to the neighborhood action plan, um, and it will say that um, we, it will be nearly impossible for us to uh, meet the, the criteria as the goalposts continue to move for us. Um, so that, that's additionally my concern is that um, without some sort of uh, relief from town meeting, um, you know, it would be um, uh, uh, it would be difficult for us to. Um, uh, meet any uh, any of these additional requirements regarding the soil or anything like that. I mean, it's um, uh, but I will provide the case law and we can just dis discuss it further if um, we are able to be on the agenda at your next meeting. Um, we would appreciate that. February twenty fifth. Excuse me. February February twenty fifth. We have two cases at night. Um, unremarkable. <coughs> Large addition may be usable open space, but nothing okay. of any great significance. Okay. So we could certainly accommodate you on the 25th of February if that's acceptable to you. Sure. Is, is there any additional direction um, from the zoning board regarding the that specific issue regarding the soil uh, or the topography that you would like us to present on? I don't want to overload you with information that is unnecessary um, because it wasn't necessarily provided in other applications. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Yep. I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise to that first factor. 
It's yeah. in the statute. Yeah, we responded to it. And um, I think what the board is saying is what we've seen was insufficient to answer that, to meet that factor. So we would welcome your arguments to meet that factor. Is there anything in particular? I mean, that's my question. I want to yeah, respond. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to respond to, you know, um, <clears throat> I can have soil testing, I can have topography. I mean, we can do all that. But if there's something in particular that you don't see as far as this property, then I'm happy to respond to it. But if, if it's just a general um, lack of understanding of the impact of the property, then we can respond to that. I just, I, I'd like to try to get away from this business about the impact of the property. Mm -hmm. This has absolutely nothing to do with the impact of the property on soil or topography or any right. of that. It has only to do with finding out that your hardship is due to something about the soil or the topography or the shape of the property or possibly the property and structures that gives rise to a hardship that we can take into account. Right. So, for God's sake, don't go out and retain anybody to do soil studies. That's entirely beside the point. The issue is to look at the case law and to figure <coughs> out how it is that you can fit what you would like to do under what the courts decide is what we can do. And it's, a, it's almost a pure question of law at this point. I don't know that there are any more facts that you can tell us. I think we get the facts, everybody gets the facts. The problem is how do you fit it within the terms of the statute so that we have something to go on uh, if we decide that, that, that a variant should, should be granted you. And it's, you know, that's where your problem is. And I, you know, the chairman has already given you one line of argument. Uh, I think the discussion has generated other possibilities. But now it's your job to go out and figure out the argument that's going to, that, that can persuade us that, that we can make a legally correct decision. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. So we will return on uh, mm -hmm. the, you said the 28th. You said 25th. 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 Okay. Do you have a continuation of that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you see may I want to um, have you fill out a continuance, request for continuance so I can have the board sign it? Okay. We'll do that right now. Sure. That. <laughs> that will bring us to docket number 3611-27 Melvin Road. Okay, in two minutes. All right, so we're up to docket number, I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, docket number 3611-27 Melvin Road. It's a special permit under... Zoning bylaw section 518, districts and uses. So if you could please introduce yourself and sure. tell us what I'm you're Iris asking for. I'm Peterson, a homeowner and resident at 27 Melvin Road. Uh, Aram Melvania and Alpha Construction, I live in our Brown Road, hopefully going to build our addition. Uh, my name is Ben Ives, I'm an architect um, uh, for the project where we're uh, seeking um, uh, relief from the zoning bylaw 5.4.2. Um, we're applying for a special permit as we uh, propose an addition that's in excess of the uh, um, 750 square foot threshold. Okay. Um, the uh, addition is for 1,190, or excuse me, um, 1,000. Uh, 190 square feet gross, which includes um, uh, basement area. Um, so um, the footprint, as you can see on the plans, is um, 24 and a third feet, roughly by 17 and two thirds foot. Um, so while the addition proposed is for over a thousand square foot, the footprint is actually pretty limited over three floors because it's over three floors. Uh, we feel that the addition is um, uh, in character uh, with a single family residential neighborhood that's around. Mm -hmm. um, it was noted by the, so the, the Department of Planning and Community Development 
reviews the, <coughs> the applications to see if they have any questions. Um, and one thing they had noted um, was that the landscape and usable open space calculations were not done properly. Okay. Um, so we would essentially put that through as a, as a requirement on the, on the final decision to correct those to the satisfaction of the, of the building department. Yes. Um, Okay, Mr. Yeah. Um, special services took the liberty to review the calculations. Okay. Uh, we did redo them. Uh, they far exceed the uh, minimums. I think the uh, open space alone is in excess of 100% uh, in that neighborhood. I'll get you a copy of the, um, um, of the new uh, criteria oh, okay. for density. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. And then there was a, I had a, the site plan had the existing peak elevation and the proposed peak elevation are different than the what are on the architectural plans. Um, neither of them are in a problematic range, but I just wanted to flag that for you so you're aware. Okay. 24.4. So the proposed peak is listed at 117, and on the plan it's at. 116.10. So I'm just. The surveyor rounded up. Rebounded up. <laughs> surveyor rounded up. Yeah, the surveyor up. rounded up, it looks like. Okay. So, if we just. Yeah, yeah just I mean, it's a 30 right foot, 35 foot. Uh, okay. And then I had a question. So the the basement floor plan. Um, so it, it looks like there's a there's two storage areas in the basement, but you're providing an egress window from the storage area. And I'm not sure why. Yeah, um, I sort of I wondered if that would come up. It's a um, it's proposed to be a storage area. Yeah. Um, maybe it'll be a ping pong table. Mm -hmm. um, there's a stair that splits the two sides. Um, we have no expectation of it being a habitable uh, living quarters at all. Mm -hmm. But um, we sort of were looking at small, you know, typical um, basement windows and realized that why not just put something that'll shed more light in there. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, if you're gonna go down two feet, go down three. Got it. Those are the questions I had. Do I remember the board have questions? And then I know that we've come across this before, so I know that planning starts putting in the uh, comment about the stormwater runoff, and we know, if I'm correct, that that's going to be taken care of anyway as a part of the process. Mm -hmm. Again, so all they need is uh, permission from the board yep. to uh, build an addition, seating 750 square feet additional in the area. All of the other conditions, such as stormwater mitigation, uh, the new tree bylaw will be in effect with this one because it, it exceeds 750, as well as all the uh, building code issues and other dimensional and density aspects of the zoning bylaw. What they have to get by is the fact that we cannot issue a permit by right that exceeds 750 square feet. Any right. questions? Patrick, any questions? Uh, Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on this? Seeing none. Oh, oh, yes, please. Sorry. I'm the neighbor of the last two streets. I've got the greatest neighbor in the world. No, we do. Because I didn't know whether they did any blast or not. Um, around the neighborhood, some of the people that came in to do work mm -hmm. did not belong on the street and started potholes. And nothing was ever fixed, and we were left with that. So I was concerned if something like that happened. Mm -hmm. That was all, but as far as the addition, it sounds great to me. Can I, can I be your name, please? I'm sorry. I said as far as the addition, it sounds great. Uh, no, I'm sorry, your name? Oh, Mary Burroughs. Thank you. And yeah. if I'm correct, there, the good neighbor agreement would be required to be a, a part as of this well. as well, which would That's be right. notification to the abutting neighbors as to who the contractor is, who's in charge of the project, what the plans are, and so that you can, if you have well, issues, you have somebody you can directly contact. 
So it'll be, I think it goes to the abutting neighbors and the abutters to the abutting neighbors. So it goes two levels of houses out. So you would definitely be included in that distribution. Oh, I, well, I didn't know whether that was the only one, but I was the only one showed up. Oh, oh no, no, it should be, yeah, yeah it should be everyone. Yeah. All right, if there's no other. So I will make a motion to Please. approve the application as it's been presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. your patience. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. The next one will be docket number 3613, 44 Lachlan Avenue. It's a special permit under zoning bylaw section 813, non conforming single family or two family dwelling. support from my neighbors. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So my We're husband, Sam, and I are working yes. to build a dormer uh, in our third floor and uh, understand that it falls under section 8.1.3 for open space. I'm sorry. Again, can I just have your name yes. for the record? Hannah Vaughn. I live at 44 Lockman. Thank you. This was just the attic. Yes. Dormer. They're facing the rear. Yes. This is one of the cases where the existing usable open space is zero. And we are changing it from zero to zero, which we have determined by convention is not a greater mm -hmm. disability. The only thing I would recommend um, for the dormer, where the roof pitch is listed at, at 2%, which is the minimum it's allowed to be, is just to make sure that it doesn't float below that. Okay. Better, to, better to err on the steeper side. Anyone from the audience who would like to speak in regards to 44 Lock on the list, please? Hi, I'm one of the neighbors there. My name is Bob Hughes, 14 Temple Street. I just would like to understand, just a point of clarification, that when someone does a dorm, can you explain a bit what the criteria is that makes it when it's within and when you're considering a variance, how can you decide yes? Sure. Um, so, for typically it, when you're dormering, you're it, so the, the zoning district is for a two and a half stories. And so the question is, how do you get to that half? Um, and by the criteria that's in the zoning bylaws, uh, the area that counts towards that half floor is anything with a ceiling height of, with a height from the floor to the underside of structure that is seven foot zero or greater under a sloped roof that has a pitch of at least 2%. So, or 212, excuse me. So, what that mean? <clears throat> what that means is that if you, you know, what it's trying to accomplish is that you can't take your entire attic floor and bump the whole thing up, because that would be a three-story building, which is not allowed. But it forces you to, under that envelope, you can create dormers, whether they're sheds or whatever, to gain that additional space in order to make that area habitable. And. Th you can just put a dorm, but it doesn't require a variance. And why is it so this is actually a special. This is actually a special permit. 
Um, and the reason it's a special permit is because the property is, it has a nonconformity to it, which is that it has no usable open space. And so if the property had usable open space, there would be no special permit process. Okay. It would buy right. Sure. Anybody else? Entertain a motion. A motion that the ap application be granted as it's been presented. Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. Good Thank you. Okay. Next up is docket number 361420 Beacon Street. Special permit under zoning bylaw. Section 518 Districts and Uses. Good evening, board members. I'll let you uh, <coughs> get the plans out. So um, I'm the applicant. My name is Dan Longchamp. I'm the homeowner at 20 Beacon Street um, and also prepared the plans here that you see tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeking relief from zoning section 5.4.2 B6, large additions, um, seeking relief for non-conforming property to construct um, 1,270 square feet of new living space. Um, the existing property is 4,931 square feet lot. With um, right now is um, on my zone on my assessor's card. It's 1,036 square feet of living space. It's actually a little less. It's like 900. Um, so um, that that's what I'm seeking. Um, we're removing part of the existing structure to provide this new structure. Um, so the total net is. Um, about 1,170 square feet of new living space. So I have filled out some of the calculations in terms of what's conforming and what isn't. Rick, you have a note on the open space gross floor area sheet? I do. So again, um, we took the liberty of looking at the application and just reworked the numbers that were, they weren't accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, they are. So the lot is, um, it, it's a good size lot. Again, just after the construction, if the, um, if the um, addition was granted, it would still have usable open space at 52%. Right now, as it stands, it exceeds 100% okay. open space, slope relatively flat, much less than 5%. It looks like you're not changing any of the, well, there are some adjustments to the setbacks, but nothing that would put it anywhere near the property line with the exception of the continuation of the existing uh, line relative to the right side property. Th that is correct. In, in looking at the condition, speaking with a builder for the project, it seems that um, in order to excavate, it may need to push in closer mm -hmm. to the property line. I'm not entirely sure that we can maintain. Closer exact, to the property line or away from the property away line? Away from okay. the property Thank line. You. Yeah, towards the inside of the site, just based on the construction of a footing. Uh, so we would take you know any precaution to make sure that we wouldn't undermine the neighbor's property. Is there any questions from the board? Is there anyone here who'd like to speak to 20 Beacon Street? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to uh, approve the application as it has been submitted. Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Congratulations. Good luck. I appreciate Great. it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, next up is docket number 3615-41-43 Pond View Road, special permit under zoning bylaw section 813, non-conforming single family or two family dwellings. Hello. 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 <laughs> we made it. Um, so I'm Juliet Packard. I'm with I'm representing Dickinson Architects and 
These are clients, Emma Murphy and Drew Ditto, and they, Ooh. and Kathy Murphy, oh, my mother. <laughs> and, and we're the homeowners. They're the homeowners of 41 through 43 Palm View Road. Okay. Um, Emma and Drew specifically own 43, the upstairs unit. 41. 41. Oh, really? Okay, 41, the upstairs unit. Um, so uh, 41 through 43 Palm View Road is a non-conforming lot with a non-conforming two-family house. Mm -hmm. Drew and Emma live in the second floor unit. Uh, would like to finish their attic as a half story so they may have a third bedroom. They are seeking to increase the gross square footage of the house. Therefore, they need relief from bylaw section 813B, which states that usable open space shall not be less than 30% of the gross square footage. The current open space is 14.88%. The proposed open space is 14.05%. This is a drop in usable open space by only three quarters of a percent. So, you brought, I'm, I guess you guys have smaller packets, but we brought uh, elevation showing what we're proposing. So two dormers, um, very similar to the docket a couple ago. Um, so existing and proposed. So the largest dormer would go over here. And that's the, the side that faces the pond? That's the side that faces the pond, yeah. Okay. So I think it's Princeton. Road, so accommodates a bedroom and a bathroom, and then on the other side of the house, there's a smaller shed dormer that accommodates a stair, which is greatly needed because you bump your head if you didn't have a dormer. Oh, yeah. So, the dormer that's on the side opposite is that staring? I noticed that the abutting house on that side has a very large dormer facing, yes, that one right there. It, are you going to stare into each other or are you just far That's enough beyond it? Right? This is the side facing our neighbor. I don't think we will stare into each other because, and I, I could be wrong, but um, I think that their dormer starts a little bit farther back and mm -hmm. the dormer over the stairs is a little bit further forward. Okay. But even if we do stare into each other, it's just the staircase, so it's just be transient. We won't okay. be yeah. spending time <laughs> in and the height of the window too will probably be mostly above okay. your eyes in location. And we can make it smaller to the privacy or although we saw the window. We stare at each other today from our bedroom. <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're, we're friendly. <laughs> the post floor plans. Door right here, door. Um, and so do you guys want to add a bit about why uh, you feel that uh, the increases square footage is the need for yes. it? Yeah. Yes. We're we're seeking relief and to add these dormers to so that we can have a third bedroom. Our our unit today is a two bedroom mm -hmm. and we moved to Arlington in 2017, and we really like it here and would like to stay here for the next 30 plus years and yep. grow our family, and having the third bedroom would make that doable. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think, yeah, just uh, having the option to expand your family in this neighborhood also, it adds social value to the neighborhood. Adding a third bedroom adds monetary value because it increases the value of the house, which therefore ultimately increases the value of the neighborhood. So. Win win. Any questions from the board? Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this? On the road? And I'm all in favor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would just note from the earlier decision that we got today that when this was approved back. Not that long ago. Right. I have a copy of that. There was, there was no open space at the time whatsoever. That is correct. So by doing the, what they did at the time, uh, they actually increased it. And so had they increased it to the number that they're now seeking to use, it would have been permitted as well. Did you show them the picture of our Yeah, backyard. I think they raised the garage, which gave them some open space. Yep. Yeah. Correct. And with the garage there, they had not Yeah. Yeah, this is our garage. We made a little tiny backyard. Yeah. And the reason for the 
decrease in the usable open space has to do with the increase in the gross floor gross area and yeah. has nothing to do with the size of the yard. Right. Okay. And so then the only question before us is, is the minor adjustment in the amount of usable open space Is there any issue with the seven criteria? And I see none in the built uh, planning department, certainly saw none either. Pat in mind, I'll entertain a motion. Motion to accept the proposal. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Wonderful. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. Okay. So we got one more item on the docket. Yeah, rules and regs. So luckily we get to do away with one. Um, so, on, so the adjustments to the comprehensive permit bylaw, I submitted to council to, who asked to submit it to um, John Witten, who wrote the original and is our uh, consultant for um, comprehensive permits. He has not gotten back to me. so. I'm going to ask that we not discuss that one. The other one, I know I printed and I know I brought it. Where are you? So from, so we had voted um, that we were okay with these last time, but we wanted to pass them through council. So the, our general rules and regulations, um, I had a couple comments back from Doug, um, and I forwarded you guys the changes. One had to do with the section 225 on the online posting of documents, um, which uh, is a little more forceful in terms of uh, documentation can be posted should, that we will require the documents come to us, uh, come with a PDF copy with the understanding that that will be made publicly available either as a part of the agenda or on the town's website. Um, so we'll have the, we will have the content and the ability to post the content. Um, we are including that and then there was uh, under 333, <clears throat> um, he thought it was important to add something about uh, the public shall adhere to rules of decorum during debate um, because we didn't really have anything um, about that and he thought that that was important to, to include because it gives us a little bit of teeth if somebody's operating outside of that that we can... Can we make sure uh, Mr. Mills reads this paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> And then there was. Oh, I think you're in violation. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. right. About that. Yes, yeah. please. I don't actually remember Robert having <coughs> specific things about decorum as opposed to the general rules of procedure that that you usually think about when you talk about them. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering whether or not we have some specific section or part of Robert's rules that we're referring to. Here. So, yeah, I mean, the, essentially the, the rules on decorum are mostly you know that you. You listen politely, you don't shout over somebody else. It's those um, pieces. Is this language focusing on issue of personalities and things like that? Is that from Robert's rules or is that language put in by town council or somebody else? Uh, so it would have been me. Um, there's a question to the chair listening to all those folks on issue of personalities and what he questioning most. Um, I think that, that, was, that came out of a conversation between myself and council um, as a way to try to. I think it came about primarily because we were discussing this immediately after the first return hearing on the Mugar property and there was a lot of heated debate and there was debate going in directions where it should oughtn't. So we wanted to make sure we included yeah, my, that. My sense is everything after the word including is absolutely right on. I'm mm -hmm. just a little bit worried about referring to Robert's rules unless we've checked Robert's rules. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that when somebody else does that, then they get excluded from the hearing. So that, uh, that they don't <coughs> find the rule that, right. that yeah. does the thing. Right. So if we, we were to actually, so if we struck Robert's rules and just said members of the public shall adhere to the rules of decorum, 
add the word rules, or I guess strike the word Roberts. So we'd say, it shall adhere to the rules of decorum during a bait, including being polite, addressing, and we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, that would be fine with me. Is there an objection? Yeah. Yep. And I thought there was, oh, and then the last one was section 343. Voting members of the board shall sign the official copy of the written decision either in person or in electronic format acceptable to the town. That's great. Okay, yeah. So that we don't have to keep right. going down. And I don't have to keep breaking through the back door. Talk to sign. Seven o'clock at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I will entertain a motion on the rules for the Zoning Board of Appeals. This is subject to anything that we get back from? Or so this, is, this has been vetted by a council. So this would be our final. This is it. This is it. With, as submitted with the word Roberts struck. I move that they, I move that the board accept these rules with uh, the striking of the word Roberts. It's Roberts, right? Yeah. Um, Second. Perfect. All in favor? Aye. 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 Just, to, just to be clear, so um, I can now accept electronic signatures. Yep. And I can file the decisions uh, signed electronically with the clerk and um, the Secretary of State, wherever else they may go. How do we do that? Okay. As a practical matter, how do we do multiple electronic signatures? Will you, will, will because are yeah. we gonna be able to each send back a signature page, or, you follow me? Yeah, no, absolutely. What's the, do you know what the procedure would be to do this? I don't, we might so have to we gotta figure that out. Yeah. But uh, I've been trying to get this, I've been trying to get this in for a while, yeah. simply because um, this board is pretty good, but in the past, I, it's been tough getting yeah. the guys to get that signature. And I only have a certain amount of time to do it. Yeah. Let me work on how we're going to do it, okay. uh, but the fact is that we've gotten the green light to go in that direction is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm still going to do is do a draft decision, uh, send it out to the board for your comments, get it back to me. I think in the time where I can write this up, uh, we'll, we'll figure that part out. Okay. Okay. Is, is that, this is, I'm just not a technical yeah. person, is that, I know DocuSign I use it with, or sure. clients use it, but is that something where we have to have the program? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it's easily downloadable, right? Must be. We can't be the only one that's running into this problem. We no. put multiple electronic signatures on the page, and we have to ask somebody under 20 how to do it. <laughs> I'm real so I get purchase and sale agreements all the time with those, yeah. so. So to make the yeah, rules and regulations official, yes. do we need to provide you with a signed copy? How does that work? Yeah, I'm going to talk to Doug. Okay. Uh, as long as you, you've already vetted it, <coughs> it sounds like you guys have yep. uh, He's probably going to have to know about deleting the Roberts out of the Roberts rule. Mm -hmm. um, but then we can go forward with it. I'll okay. ask him how we can officially adopt that. Yeah, perfect. And then hopefully I'll hear back from him in not so long about the, uh, the comprehensive permit rules. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And when is the next MUGAR? MUGAR it's a, my understanding is that we're supposed to receive documentation in March, and the next hearing would be in April. Yeah, so that's that's what what it is. Is. So recall it was April 14th. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. We're going to have that in the main town hall. Oh, oh yeah. maybe. Yeah. Change of venue. Is there any other business before the Sunny Board of Appeals? No. Vote to it or. I just, motion to adjourn. Yep. I just have a procedural question. Yeah. Um, you have 20 days to appeal any decision, right? Correct. And so after that point, be in touch with the building department? Or how was how that um, finalized, I guess, the decision? Contact the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll step you through it. Okay. All right, great. Thank okay. you so much. Perfect. Uh, you Thank can, you. The Zoning Board of Appeals is easily reached online. Go to the website. Okay. And just um, give me the information. And we'll get back to you. Okay, I appreciate okay. it. What's your name, please? Dan. Dan the Long Champ. Okay. At 20 Beacon. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, have a good Thank night. Yeah, late night. Anyways. All right. I heard a motion to adjourn. All in yes, favor? Aye. Right. We are adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you.